Welcome. You're listening to Sports Econ 101, the show where we discuss sports topics from a business perspective. I'm your host, Edward Brown, along with my co-host, F.P. Santangelo Jr. Hopefully, Vern Glenn and Russell Jackman will join us in the next segment. At each commercial break, we're going to ask a sports trivia question. And today, since it is Christmas, we're... Merry Christmas, <laughs> F.P. Happy holidays to, <laughs> to all. Happy, so, uh, happy Festivus. Festivus, yeah, Festivus. For the rest of us, that's right, from Seinfeld. Um, So today's trivia theme is Christmas Past, NBA Christmas Day Games. Ooh, okay. So it'll be kind of of interesting to see how much you know about your NBA basketball trivia. All right, when we come back, uh, we're going to talk about a ticket stub for Michael Jordan's debut game. You won't believe how much it sold for, just a ticket stub. Uh, Las Vegas gets the uh, 2024 Super Bowl. And the NFL not following its own rules. Um, still have a little bit of the talk about the baseball lockout. And uh, Urban Meyer, I uh, wonder what his uh, future is going to look like and whether or not he's going to get any uh, pay. It looks like uh, each side is kind of posturing. I mean, you're talking how many millions of dollars? I think it was like four or five or something like that, right? Even something more. Something like that. It's, 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 it's a fair amount to, uh, to, to, to uh, discuss. Let's put it that way. All right. Uh, this segment of Sports Econ 101 is sponsored by Pacific Private Money, still providing mortgage investments currently yielding over 6% secured by real estate. It doesn't get any more conservative than that. Check them out at pacificprivatemoney.com. And when we come back, uh, again, hopefully the boys will join us, but if they don't, FP and I will be able to take care of this ourselves. So stay with us. Don't touch that dial. Sports Econ 101. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Edward Brown here along with F.P. Santangelo Jr. I don't know where our other guys are. Would they sleep in today? What do they think? It's Christmas? Come on. Yeah. I can't really <laughs> talk, though. I slept in last time after working a, a Warriors game to, like, what, 12 o'clock at night, 12 a.m. in the morning. So, well, see, we're, we're not – well, you're you're still young. I'm, I'm not that young anymore, but I, I, I still remember. You know what my favorite job in the world was? When what? I was 16 years old and I worked at the bowling alley. Oh, I loved it. That was I still have so many so many good memories. In fact, I loved it so much that one time I did an eight hour shift, which is really ten hours because you have to get there two hours early to you know clean bathrooms, vacuum the rug, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff, right? And about about two hours before my shift ended, I get a call from the guy who's supposed to take over the next shift saying, "Hey, Edward, um, I'm going out on a date. Can you take my uh, take my shift?" And I said. Absolutely, I'd be delighted to. So I, I, I literally worked 20 hours in one day. I went from 6 a.m. all the way to 2 a.m. And oh my. I, 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 I'm 16 years old, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any responsibilities. And I, uh, 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 a little, just a little tired at 2 a.m. Oh, but yeah. boy, I was ready to go. And then I had to work the next day. So it was great. It was great. I loved it. Just to have the stamina of somebody that's young is amazing. I'm I'm turning 27 in March, so I'm still pretty young. Yeah, but still, it's like catching up to me quick. Trust yeah. me, I'm starting to <laughs> I'm starting to see what everyone's talking about. Okay, when they get to yeah, a certain age. Yeah, but 27 though, I mean, you you have some responsibilities. You know, when you're 16, you're living at home. You know, mom and dad pay for everything, do that's your true. laundry and stuff. It's totally totally different. Uh, that's true. So you're 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 a man. You're a man's man. Okay, uh, talk about the ticket stuff. So Michael Jordan's debut game against the Washington Bullets, back then they were called the Washington Bullets, uh-huh. sold for $264,000 for a ticket stub. That's I mean, crazy. That is, that is really crazy. I mean, I guess one thing is to say, okay, there's a limited number of ticket stubs out there, potentially, what, 20000 at the most, but most people probably didn't keep it. And yeah, so that's where the scarcity is. But all I, I mean, it's just a ticket stub. It's not even like, you know, a jersey or signed anything. Go ahead. Edward, can I be honest with you? Yes, please. I thought this was going to sell for more. No. I really did. With how much people have money, disposable income here in the United States and how many people love sports and how many people idolize Michael Jordan. I mean, he's yeah. the head figure of a billion dollar company now on top of all that. And it's going for $264,000 for his debut. I thought this was going to go for at least a million. But then I saw the record, and the record previously was from the 1903 Game 3 World Series. And that sold for, I think, 
I read one hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. That's all. So that one. Yeah, that's all. So when you think about that, so the previous ticket stubs in nineteen oh three World Series, obviously there's baseball fanatics and there's a lot yeah. of people that love baseball that have money, right? Yeah. But when you're talking about Michael Jordan, I'm thinking like this ticket stub's worth a million at least. But, so but, but I think is, maybe this is an investment. Well, that's that, it's got to be rather than just someone who just you know, you know. Well, I mean, I, it's hard. It's hard to say, but. I look at it, I say, I, I can't imagine that the ticket stub says Michael Jordan's debut. It's just a ticket stub that just says- I know, but have you ball? seen what they could do with the frames as I'm sitting here? I know people at home can't see or who's listening right now in their car, but I literally have framed jerseys behind me and they look pretty cool, right? But imagine if you had that frame ticket, like right as you're walking in or right in the man cave or something like that. I mean, that's gotta be worth a lot of money. I think the Mets owner, uh, the Michael Cohen, I think that's his name, yeah. uh, spent like $17.5 million on a piece of art. And the art wasn't Michael Jordan's debut ticket stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's so funny because I, uh, I actually think it's so funny. For some reason, that just popped into my head. You remember the movie Wall Street? With, yes. Right? With Gordon Gecko and all that stuff. And I remember Charlie Sheen makes a comment to the, the pretty girl. I can't remember who it was now about how uh, Gordon Gecko, boy, he really was like stupid to spend $50,000 on this piece of art. And, uh, you know, because it was a bunch of gobbledygook nothingness. And um, uh, she, she makes a comment about how, no, 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 he's actually really smart. He, he, he does really well on this. And uh, when my daughter was three, what, three in third grade, uh, they were studying art. And they, you know, Jackson Pollock is? Yes. <clears throat> okay. So... They, they decided to do their own Jackson Pollock type paintings. And when she brought it home, I couldn't tell the difference between a Jackson Pollock and what she did. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I, you know. <laughs> but isn't it actualized assets that you can actually sell to? So that's money actualized. You have it in your, in your possession, right? So even that ticket stub, for example, you're having a, a tough time, right? Say the bank took all your money, everything's foreclosed, but you have that ticket stub, you could sell it and then you could get money back, right? So that's kind of the thing that you could do too, right? Uh, well, you're right. If if there's a willing buyer out there, okay, it, that's all it is is willing buyer, willing seller. It's someone. Who's willing I, to I honestly think that in like ten years, this ticket's going to be worth double its its value. So the the story I want to bring up, we were talking about in the commercial break, is I actually was at LeBron James' first game in Sacramento. He played against the Sacramento Kings. I remember him walking up on the court. I was there early. Um, he was wearing a Yankees fitted cap and then he had a, a white long t-shirt and he had and baggy pants. And that was right when they implemented the rules that you need to look proper when you're coming into the NBA games, you know, when you're arriving. And it was a big controversy that, oh, oh, this rookie is like showing up with a fitted Yankees cap and he plays for the Cleveland Cavaliers. It doesn't make any sense. But I mean, I remember he didn't do too much in that game, but he had a, a dunk that like still you'll see in highlight reels today. It was his first ever dunk and I was there to see it. And I was really curious what a LeBron James ticket set would go for. Good maybe point. now it'd probably be worth, I'd may say maybe like 10, 20K, maybe 50K. Yeah. But like, think about like in 50 years when all the documentaries come out and you know, all the hype yeah. about LeBron James and True. you know, the kid from the kid from Ohio, all that stuff, the kid, yeah. yeah, that grew up to be this and that without a father. And he's got a pretty inspirational story. So, um. sure. well, or, you know, uh, Curry coming out, you know, a, a ticket stub for him. The, oh, yeah. He, I guess the thing is, it's like people nowadays might hold on to that stuff. It, it's going to be the scarcity of it, too. And when Michael yeah. Jordan, I mean, he was a big deal coming in because he did so well at North Carolina, pretty much like LeBron, everybody knew he was going to do well. But back then, what was that, 1984, if I'm not mistaken? You know, it was in the early 80s, so that was even before the baseball card fanatical thing yeah, the where they're overproducing of cards, like I think 85 or 86. So, uh, you know, go, like going back to the Hannes Wagner card, I mean, Wayne yeah. Gretzky bought it for, I think, 750000 years ago, and we all thought he was, you know, crazy for paying that for a, a, a cartoon picture of a guy, you know, <laughs> even though it's Hannes Wagner, right? But Oh, Absolutely. It, it totally now it's sold for three million, I think, not too long ago. Yeah, I think it's actually gone up in value. I think it's gone to like okay. something crazy. So um but it's just crazy how like the these figures are becoming mythological yeah. 
almost like tales of like, oh, so-and-so, Babe Ruth, uh, Hank Aaron, Barry Bonds, and their memorabilia is skyrocketing by the second. So this is actually a good investment, I think. Well, I think part of it is the, the COVID issue. You know, people, they've got nothing else to do. And so, so they see the highlights. They're, yeah, they're remodeling their houses. They're uh, buying sports memorabilia and all that. i uh, tell you what, we're going to go to our uh, first commercial break here. Uh, talking Christmas NBA games. Okay, why was the 1998, and you were just a young Turk back then, uh, why was the 1998 NBA Christmas Day game canceled? Ooh. And it was the first ever Christmas Day game that was canceled. All right, that's our trivia question. Uh, email edward at sportsecon101.com. The answer to this question, we'll see if you know it, uh, people out there. The audience, uh, why was the 1998 NBA Christmas Day game canceled? And it was the first ever Christmas Day game that was canceled. All right. Stay with us. You are listening to Sports Econ 101. Don't touch that dial. We're going to be right back. Well, welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Edward Brown here along with F.P. Santangelo Jr. Hey, our first tri trivia question was, why was the 1998 NBA Christmas Day game canceled? Uh, was it a year without a Santa Claus? Yeah, close. A lockout. <laughs> yes, that makes sense. And yeah. a lockout. Yeah. And uh, speaking of lockouts, uh, there's a baseball lockout going on right now, ain't there? Hey, we can't talk about it, right? Oh. No, no MOB teams are allowed to talk to their players. They're not allowed to post about their players on social media. They can't talk to them in the offseason, which is really unfortunate for people that have injuries right now because you can't even give them a regimen on how to get better. They got to go find their own, uh, they got to find their own physical therapist and things of that nature. So it's ridiculous. They got to get, get their own workout plans, all that. They can't communicate with their team. So it's been a running joke on social media. I'm sure you've seen it, but the missing heads, like on the, on the website and stuff like that, everyone's avatars are missing heads and <laughs> hey, you can't talk about this, all that. And all MLB oh. has been posting is things in the past. You'll see it's only highlights from the past. They're, they're trying to play up the, the old baseball, you know, the, the romanticism. But the lockout right now, as I was describing it to you, Edward, earlier, yeah. is like the is like a, a couple, a married couple that's, you know, on the rocks a little bit. And uh, they're starting to sleep in separate rooms. And they're not talking to each other. So maybe maybe after the holidays when it's less stressful, they'll get back together like, hey, you know what? Uh, I, I would maybe said something that I shouldn't have said. <laughs> maybe we can get back together you know I, i'm kind of tired of sleeping on the couch yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's figure this out oh that's so funny because it, it it's it's so funny how they it, there's all this attack 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 and then suddenly when it gets kind of finalized it's sort of like well let's all be friends and kind of go back to normal and you know i don't, I don't know how you put that behind you well the the one of the main arguments in this whole lockout and one of the main reasons for it is arbitration and arbitration is the process that after you, uh, before you come a free agent, you go through arbitration process and they value you based on, you know, your worth, based on how well you performed. And then you, you get a, a number and then they can take you to court. The team can take you to court and say, you're not actually worth this number. And then they undercut the number that they said they were going to pay you. And that's a completely legal process. And it really makes people upset. Yeah. And players have even told me they've sat in their arbitration hearing in court and have listened to the team that they play for tell them, well, he's not good at this. You know, he actually does this wrong. Our algorithms say he's going to project to not be that good. <laughs> Telling him to his face that he's not worth the money that they're paying him. And then they at, they agree, they settle in between the price that they originally had. So, Boy, that's, you know, I'm just thinking if I'm a player, the psychological part of that has really got to, I, I don't know, I, I don't think that would make me kind of go, well, then I'm going to do work really hard to prove myself. It would make me go, you know what? I, I appreciate getting paid lots of money, but you're not, you're, there's, there's, you're not putting value in me. Imagine if your employer right now called you and said, hey, we're going to take you to court. And then in court said, you know what? We want him. He's good, but he's not that good. And I'll tell you why he's not that good. You know what? He could be a lot better. You know what? He's not actually that good at all. We're trying to get him at the cheapest price. And that's how it goes. Yeah, yeah. That's, and that's, that's why everybody that wants to get rid of that process. And that's why, one of the reasons why there's a lockout. And I completely understand it. It's just, it just feels like in bad faith, it ruins the romanticism of the game. Yeah. And then it really makes it more of a business more than anything. Because now you realize, oh, okay, 
I'm not playing for the city anymore. I'm not playing for my teammates. I'm playing for a, a corporation. Yeah. And then how much of it then do you, as Steve Garvey would say, uh, you know, you, you don't look at the uh, name on the back, you look at the name on the front. Yeah. You know, the team player. I mean, it'd be kind of hard to be super team player, even if you love your teammates, if your employer is treating you like that. So I can, I can, I can really appreciate that that's tough, but I also is what's hard is, is when, you know, these guys get these millions of dollars of contracts and then the, the next year or two or three, they don't perform anywhere near where they were. So, exactly. uh, you know, it, I, I kind of like the idea and I don't know exactly how you do this. Like, okay, we're, we're going to pay everybody the same, but, but when you prove yourself, you get all these big bonuses. The well, you used, get, is, you used to get paid for what you did, and now you're going to get paid for what you're about to do. And that's a huge paradigm shift. That's not a traditional baseball baseball thing whatsoever. You always pay people for what they did in the past. Like, thank yeah. you. Thank you for bringing yeah. us a World yeah. Series. Thank you for yeah. being the guy for all these years. We're going to take care of you. And now it's like, no, 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 we're trying to compete. We're going to pay for the projection of what we think you're going to be. But and that really made a lot of baseball purists and a lot of players and coaches upset. Sure. I understand it from a business aspect. If you're trying to win, you want to pay people that are going to do good, not who what they've done, right? You want to pay you them for what they're going to do. But, but you don't, A, you don't know if someone's going to get hurt. And then yeah. also then th that puts a lot of interesting pressure on the manager to decide when to put a player in. And, you know, like if, if let's say uh, there, there was a time when, I, and I, I, I think it was Gary Carter, if I'm not mistaken, part of his contract was if, if, if they had like 2 million fans show up during the year, then you get like a $250,000 bonus. Oh, incentive bonus. Incentive yeah. bonus like that, right? Well, yep. apparently he didn't keep track of it. And there that's was on only, his agent. First yeah, that's on, that's on his agent, yeah. And there was like, you know, they were like something like 500 tickets short. And so if he, if that were the case, you know, he, he should just tell the agent, just go out and just buy 500 tickets, you know, right. it's going to cost a few thousand dollars. And so, you know, he missed the mark, but you know, it's, it's like, if you, uh, it, it's same thing in football, right? Okay. If, if you take, if, if you catch so many passes or take so many snaps as a quarterback, I mean, the coach can decide what the play is. Right? Oh, yeah. and, and so that you really mess around with those analytics on that. Oh, absolutely. And there's a lot of shady things that go on whenever you go like, why isn't so-and-so playing? Like, well, yes. what's going on? Well, it's a lot more transparent in baseball. It's because they're not trying to trigger anything that would make them a free agent sooner. They want to hold on to them as long as they possibly can. So that's why, like, they get called up on certain dates. That's why, like, you, you, there's an outfielder that shouldn't be an outfielder in the big leagues. And you have this young stud in the minor leagues that should be a perennial all-star. And he's yeah. been down there for three years because they don't want to bring him up and and trigger his his five years early. So you have five years before he can become a free agent. Yeah, so they're trying absolutely. to get rid of this whole thing because yeah. it's just ridiculous. It's all set up so the owners win. Well, and again, we're talking about billionaires and millionaires and that's where the disconnect comes in. And that's where people just yeah. turn turn the dial because they're like, oh, screw, screw yeah. these rich, good looking athletic people that want more money. But the truth is in baseball, the average career is around six, seven years, right? Which is actually pretty high considering most sports. Yeah. But that's all the money you're pretty much going to make your entire life. Now, is that six and seven years? Uh, that's once you get called up, right? That doesn't include the minor leagues. Yeah, that's once you okay. get called up. Yeah, you okay. make nothing in the minor nothing leagues. Minor. You, you pretty much have like a 10 to 15 year professional career. Okay. Like that would be ideal with the minor leagues included. But yeah, it's crazy. I think it actually might be lower now. I think it's actually five years and like three years for relief pitchers because the, the relief pitcher cycle has really, really dwindled that average. So yeah, that um, makes sense. yeah, you got to make all your money as soon as you can. And if not, you're going to open up a gym somewhere or like a travel baseball team. That's it. It's I've seen so many major league baseball players do that and be successful by the way at that. But it's like you go from being worshipped to being on a team to making this money and then it's gone. And that's all the money you're going to make. And well, that's gonna... why you, you got to have really good financial advice. Uh, yeah. And a lot of these guys don't get degrees too. They like, none of them have degrees. They just go right out of high school now, or, you know, they leave yeah. college early. So, and then if they don't have a good mentor or they have, you know, the entourage or people hanger on, you know, and then all the, the, the evil people out there trying to steal their money. Uh huh. And, yeah. They, I don't know how to, to fix that part of it, but 
you know, it kind of reminds me too, like back in the old, old, old days, you know, when you like in the early 1900s and you had the federal league and all these other leagues, they, they would have uh, baseball players would just jump from one team to another, you know, okay, who's going to pay me the highest. And back then it was maybe only, you know, $2,000 yeah. a year or whatever, but it really made the whole discombobulated situation. And, and that's why they finally had to, you know, put in the anti, the non antitrust laws because Ooh. it's like, it wasn't, there was no, Get this, Major League Baseball is the only entity in the United States that has an exemption from that clause after yeah. Supreme Court ruling. So they can do whatever they want, and they have been doing. That's why the minor leagues and the independent leagues, they just have their way with them because they can do whatever they want. They're the only monopoly active in the United States. And I believe it was because when it came down to the final decision in the, I think it was 1910s, 1920s, yeah. Yeah. the Supreme Court judge was a Cubs fan. <laughs> and, he want, and he wanted to see the Cubs win. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they did it in 07 and 08, I believe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's what it was. It was really early in the early 19th century. So um. Yeah. And then you had uh, uh, over 100. It's so funny, too, because if you think about it, there was everyone was talking about the Red Sox. Remember 2004? And it was like, oh, it had been so many years since they won. But everyone forgot the Cubs didn't win since 1908. Oh, compared yeah. To 19... 14. So, I mean, it was, they were even longer, but people seem, sort of seem to forget about it, I guess, because it took them so long just to even get in the World Series. Hey, oh, Taylor, yeah. we're going to cut to our uh, next commercial break here. We're talking, uh, let's see here, the uh, theme is Christmas past, NBA Christmas Day games. All right, in 2004, a huge showdown was anticipated at the NBA Christmas Day between two players who had previously been teammates, but now they're going to be going against each other, all right? Which two players are we talking about? All right, email edward at sportsecom101.com, the answer to this question. In 2004, a huge showdown was anticipated at the NBA Christmas Day game between which two players who had previously been teammates? That's our trivia question. Stay with us. Sports Econ 101, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. I'm Edward Brown, along with F.B. Santangelo Jr. Don't know where the other boys are, but huh, too bad for them they're missing today's show. All right, here's our second trivia question about NBA Christmas Day games. In 2004, a huge showdown was anticipated at the NBA Christmas Day game between which two players who had previously been teammates? So I got to be honest, as an NBA fan, I grew up in Sacramento. I'm a Kings fan. Okay. The, the Kings were the only team that existed to me. Believe it or uh, not, because I, I just didn't follow the NBA that much, so I don't know this one. Uh, Kobe and Shaq. Oh, okay. I yeah. should have guessed it. I was going to say either Kobe or Shaq or, or somebody big during that time. Two, two big names, yes. Fortunately, I know those names very well as a Kings fan, so. Yeah, yeah, they are. They, actually, most uh, uh, most teams kind of torched the Kings. They, they had, they had, I remember they had one really good year. Uh, I don't remember, it was a was it I mean, they had Doug Christie, Mike Bibby, Chris Weber, Keja yeah. Stravakovic. They, they, they were loaded one year. Yeah, and they but, were really uh, trying to make a run. And then the whole scandal came out with the NBA ref that was working with the mob that fixed oh, the yeah. game against the Lakers. That's right. And uh, then Mike, the Lakers uh, went on to win. Mike Donnelly. Yep. Yeah. yep. And the Lakers went on to win that year. Uh, we're still really mad about it here in Sacramento. Sure. I'm doing this show right now. But, uh, yeah, people still bring it up to this day. Yeah. Very bitterly, because yeah. they know even during that time something fishy was up. I even remember as a kid, like, oh, these refs, man, these refs, and you know we hear that all the time. But yeah, it's but kind of, uh, it's kind of, I guess, liberating to know that you know the fix was in. Yeah. It was literally in. So yeah, I mean that, that almost almost makes it better in a way. Uh, yeah, I mean, kind just of, because but... then 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 you know, okay, well. I, I'm not crazy. These really. I'm not that crazy. Close. Exactly. Uh, How many times right. we think that when we're seeing these games today, where it's like, "What the hell? What yeah. was that call?" <laughs> In fact, what wasn't Vladi Divac on that team at that time? Yeah, Vladi Divac was Vlade, too. Vlade, yeah, and then now Big Shot Bob Hori, um, was he? I can't remember. Was he on the Kings then, or was he on the Lakers that killed the Kings? I'm not sure. Okay, because because he he I mean they used to call him Big Shot Bob because he would. I mean, he was a very he was a good player. No yeah. doubt about it. But boy, he would just come through in the clutch with the three pointers when when needed. It was just uh, just incredible. Um, yeah, I used to I used to enjoy watching the, uh, the the Kings play, especially since 
you know, I mean, you get the Warriors, and then what's the next closest team? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Not bad. Uh, let's see here. So what's going on with the NFL not following its own rules about forfeits due to the virus? Yeah, so what's going on right now in the NFL is that they told the vaccinated player – well, there, I should start over. There's an agreement at the beginning of the season that if you are vaccinated, we don't have to do the rapid test anymore. That was agreed upon. If you show your vaccination card and your status, you know, you get these uh, liberties. You get to do more things. You don't have to mask around. So there's an incentive, right? All of a sudden, with the new Omicron variant that came out, they said, no, 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 we're going to start testing everybody. And what's happening is that people are getting positives left and right, not only in the NFL, but the NBA decided to do this too, and then the NHL as well, for safety and precautious reasons. The Omicron variant, though, is weaker. It's yep. been studied and it's weaker than the other variants, the Delta variant, the original variant of coronavirus. And what's been happening, as I understand it, and I've done a little research on this, you know, <laughs> I can't say it from, you know, like, like from Facebook or anything like that, but just hearing from players and talking to, to other people is that when you go outside, right, you get a little viral load. When, when you're out and about, you're vaccinated, right? You're, you're safer yourself, right? You get a little viral load, like either in your nose, right? Yep. You can't spread it as much as if you didn't have the vaccine, right? Okay. But your body fights it without any symptoms or anything. It's like you're just a normal person, but you just have a little bit of the virus in you. Okay. Your body takes care of it, done deal within maybe half a day or a day, right? But okay. these tests, these rapid tests will show up positives. And even some of them aren't even like 99% accurate. I think they were like 60 to 70% accurate to begin with. Right. So it's causing all these issues right now among all sports leagues where you're seeing like these crazy COVID outbreaks, but there's, there's no issues and there's no like long-term effects that we've seen with other nasty variants. Right. Well, so that's what I'm kind of wondering with, okay, so let's go 2019 and before, right? So no COVID. Yeah. I mean, during flu season, people got the flu. And then people got over it. Some people had it serious and, and had other effects. And if this Omicron thing has is supposedly not such a big, I won't say not such a big deal, but it's much less uh, uh, harassing than regular COVID. Especially if you're vaccinated too. That's very Especially important. if you're vaccinated. So what's, I mean, why don't they just kind of go, okay, listen, it's flu season and uh, treat it like that. Well, this is why a lot of players are upset because they complied, they got vaccinated, they got boosted even, they got their mm-hmm. third shot. And now, during very vital time in the NFL season, uh, during, you know, any season really where, like, you're, you're finding getting momentum, your team chemistry in the NBA and the NHL, like, this is, like, starting to where it's go time in those leagues, too. Yeah. Guys are, are having to sit out because they're getting positives, and now they're going, what the hell is going on? Like, I did everything I needed to do, yeah, and I'm still getting positives here. What's the deal? Like, we got to figure this out. And then I think the NFL was you had to get six positive tests or six, excuse me, negative tests by the end of the week to play in your game. And guys will be getting four or five negative tests, but if they get one positive, sorry, man, you got to sit out this week. And we're even seeing, we're recording this on Tuesday with the doubleheader NFL games. Yeah. And there's a guy still sitting out tonight after them trying to, you know, get around the forfeiture rules and all these things. So uh, I felt bad for the Browns yesterday in particular where Baker yeah. Mayfield you know, he's playing with like just the most jacked up body possible and he still wants to be out there and he can't because of health and safety protocol. So it's crazy. Yeah, that, I, that's why, again, I, I kind of, it's, it's very, very frustrating uh, for, 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 for me, for these people. You know, I, I, I get it that, you know, when you're playing football and basketball, you know, you're, your bodies are so close together and there's sweat and all that kind of stuff. I mean, again, prior to any COVID, I'm sure there was still a lot of, bad stuff health-wise going on between players just because of the proximity oh yeah of course like we, we've heard like teams you know get the flu like all together whether it was you yeah. know they all went out the night before or they actually yeah. had the flu so that that happens like flu ravaged teams that happens it's 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 pretty common but i think just the severity and um what we've seen in the past with covid mm-hmm. and how we were still like in lockdown and all those people still passed away very sadly and unfortunately, yeah, like the thing is, okay, but look at okay, so so look at the players before the vaccine, right? Yeah. How many basketball players died from COVID? 
None did, but unfortunately, a few developed some heart conditions, and some of them developed long-term lung issues that would that did okay. affect their career, particularly with college athletes too. I've seen a lot of stories of college athletes forever their career changed because they got the coronavirus, and you know whether they didn't know what to deal with it or how to treat it, just because it's so novel, it it's creating lifelong problems for people. So I understand why why people are kind of scared of it. Uh, just because of the long-term issues, we don't understand the virus that well. But I think what's going on now is simply ridiculous. Like if you're if you're vaccinated and you're boosted, and it studies show like that, it the causes like long-term effects to go away. Um, yeah. You're you're not susceptible to it, and you can't spread it as often while you're vaccinated. It's like, what are we doing here? I, well, even some of let's say the college players, uh, some of them are not in the bowl games. And it's probably not COVID. It probably has to do with, hey, I don't want to blow out a knee. Oh, yeah. In my career. So, you know, it, right. it, there's a whole bunch of injuries that can happen, probably a lot more than the long-term repercussions of COVID. I mean, how many guys get hurt and, and, that, and their career is sidelined for either ever or, uh, you know. It's assumption of risk. It really is in everything you do. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Urban Meyer, his risk. <laughs> um, so, so he he's obviously he's out at the head coach of the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars. And what I thought was interesting is it, they rather than just kind of saying, "Listen, you're out because you know our, our team is doing lousy and uh, players don't like you or whatever," suddenly it seems like they're bringing up this. He got he's he gets fired and uh, for cause for kicking a kicker <laughs> and. <laughs> I don't know all the, the the ins and outs of it, but really, I mean, uh, I don't. Did, how severe was it? I mean, I remember even watching the movie Patton and George C. Scott playing Patton gets in trouble as, and here he is a general for slapping a. And this was back in 1945. And that's actually a true story. He gets in trouble for slapping a a, a soldier. Um, I mean, if this was during the Civil War, they would have said, "Yeah, right, go back into the line," you know. Um, but even in 1945, they still kind of, you know, okay, hey, you're not supposed to touch players or, or that sort of thing. So I, I don't know how severe this kicking was. I mean. So Josh Lambeau, the Jaguars kicker that was kicked by Urban Meyer, and the story came out, and Urban Meyer was so, like, ju- it was just a great time to fire him anyways. He was doing horrible. There's a lot of uh, dysfunction in the locker room you have your franchise QB that you just drafted in the first round, Trevor Lawrence saying like, we just need to get rid of drama and we'll start winning games, like get rid of drama. And that was kind of pointed at urban because he started this whole drama thing with Tim Tebow in the, oh, yeah. in the off season, bringing him in. And that was kind of a joke. Yeah. And then the whole thing with the woman and him staying behind in Ohio oh, and yeah, him with his mistress and NFL coaches never stay behind. <laughs> they always travel with the team. So it's just been one thing after another. And then Josh Lambeau uh, said in a statement that he got kicked for missing a field goal. And Urban Meyer came up to him and said some expletives and say, make your so-and-so kicks. And he kicked him. And he's like, it was about a 5 out of 10 kick. He's like, it wasn't that hard. But he said it was really unprofessional. I've never seen that in the NFL before. So if you think where Urban Meyer comes from, Ohio State, right? Yeah. We're talking Woody Hayes. Yeah, I was just know what happened with Woody Hayes. Right. He, he, I think it was a Clemson player that he punched on the sideline and that was it for him. But he was notorious for just choking kids and throwing them down and slamming them. So college football is a lot different than the NFL. We're talking about professionals here and the best of the best. They're not going to put up with any of that. I don't care if you got the, you got the most uh, country guy that, you know, believes in country weapons to (laughs) to straighten out so-and-so and and I got to teach so-and-so a lesson the old country way or, you know, let's go man-to-man about this. That doesn't really happen in the NFL and especially in today. Maybe in the past, but not anymore. And especially with a kicker, like like kickers are notorious and have a reputation for being the softer athletes on a football team, right? Whether that's true or not, it's to be said, but kicking a kicker was not a great option for Urban Meyer and I kind of and stories are keeping out coming out about him about just being a bad person doing this and doing that um when this kind of a media attack happens I I kind of flinch a little bit just because it's like okay was he just mean to the media and they finally like getting a shot at him or was he really just a bad guy so when a player comes out though and says something like this this just tells me like he was not made for professional sports 
he's maybe a college guy because college kids kind of need that a little bit. They need to get their, their butts yeah. kicked. Yeah. But you can't tell a, like a grown man with a family and kids and kick them and tell them to well, make that, And that's, his, I mean, that's his livelihood. He, you know, yeah, so he, he understands he needs to make his kicks. He's trying to feed his family, right? Exactly. Yeah, he's not trying to miss kicks. That's just yeah, stupid. Because because in college, not not all the players are going to end up going to the NFL. Yeah, and college kids do stupid things all the time. They go out parties. They stay out late. They do that. Like you, sometimes you need to get in a college kid's face and let them know, like, man, you're screwing up your life. Yeah. Like you have a lot of potential here. Figure it out. Yeah. NFL players. You're in the NFL now, man. Figure it out. Sink or swim. That's how it goes. And there's an understanding there in all professional sports. So, and there's there, I mean, definitely there's a lot of professional athletes who like uh, rugs, you know, and just his, yeah. boom, he's done. But yeah, okay, hey, we're going to cut to our third trivia question here. Which Orlando Magic coach was fined in 2009 after saying that the NBA should do away with Christmas Day game? He actually got fined for saying that. Saying basically, and then even now LeBron kind of says, hey, yeah, you know what? Uh, we kind of want to spend time with our families, you know? Of course, there's a family. They in at Christmas now. They don't even play hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that, that's, that's a good point. All right, stay with us. Sports Econ 101, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Last time for today, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with F.P. Santangelo Jr. You know what? I think because it's Christmas, the guy said, eh, let's not do the show today. But Thanks a lot, guys. You could have told me. Huh. Yeah, All almost right, like NBA players during Christmas. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, speaking of the NBA, which Orlando Magic coach was fined in 2009 after saying that the NBA should do away with Christmas Day game? I don't know the coach, but go for it. Stan Van Gundy. Oh, Stan Van Gundy, okay. Yeah, so you know Jeff, uh, he does the – yeah. I like Jeff. He's, he knows basketball really well. He does it with Mark Jackson, which I guess yeah. he coached him, didn't he? Yeah. All right. Uh, so, and lastly, uh, the uh, uh, Las Vegas gets the 2024 Super Bowl. Good for them. Brand new stadium. Uh, I, th I, I can only imagine how popular that's going to be. Yeah, that's going to go nuts. And the first thing my mind goes to always when they announce these Super Bowl locations, right? I'm like, yeah. who's playing the halftime show? Yes. <laughs> I don't even and think you know, about You know how much like, they get paid for that? Lots, Nothing. right? Nothing. They, oh, yeah. It's yeah. all publicity, right? It's all publicity. Like okay. We're going to cut out. Here's our thoughts for the day. My recliner and I have a long history. We go way back. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> you like that one? And uh, I'm scared of bad egg puns. Hey, it's no yoke, guys. <laughs> Sorry. That's, these are dad jokes. I gotta, where's Vern when I need him to? But that's okay. You I like it. I you like that. I'm learning from the best right now from when I'm a dad one day. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. Tune in next week to Sports Econ 101. We'll be discussing sports topics from a business perspective and asking more sports trivia questions. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm your host, Edward Brown. We'll see you next week. So long. <laughs>